Hello. I'm going to go through um, my sharpening method. I talk a lot about my little cobalt back saw and uh, how I resharpen it and how well it cuts. And you can look at that cutting test and little comparison tests. Just they're not scientific, but I think they give you a good idea of what the saw is capable of. And uh, I'm going to sharpen this saw, so I'll just show you the, the 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 general setup here. This is three quarter plywood. It has a board between it. I've tapered that board a little, which causes these to want to come together. So, if you uh, make one, you want to remember to do that. This board here is only to help me get it in the vise, and it's a place where the vise squeezes. The little boards up here on each side are where the saw slips in. I slip the saw in, and I have the teeth up about a heavy eight, like so. They were beveled or angled to fit the handle. You need to watch how they go into your saw handle. So there's the general setup. I'll get set up now and start filing teeth. Okay, I'll show you a couple things. This is my saw holder, or saw vise. It's chucked in the bench vise. This, I don't like any movement, so sometimes I'll put a seat clamp at the ends, which you can do, period. You can put two pieces of wood seat clamps on the saw if you don't want this. If you have a vise that it will fit in, you can put that whole setup in there. Sometimes you can put the whole setup in a vise and skip the seat clamps. The only reason I have the seat clamps is I can't stand any movement on the saw and I like to lessen that vibration all I can because it, it makes such a, a more pleasant experience to have this sound instead of a screeching sound. So the next thing I do, take a sharpie or a permanent marker, I go on top of the teeth. going backwards on the saw and I'll do one light pass backwards on the saw with a straight file. You don't have to stress about getting way off. You, 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 you just want to hold level but don't stress if you're way off one way or the other. Try not to be. It's not like you gotta have a joining file, a uh, file joiner tool to do this but that's nice if you can acquire one. Uh, but anyway, just set it on there and eyeball it nice and level. You've got a little bit of an angle. And one pass. And if I can't see shiny teeth, which means I haven't made them equal, some some teeth were more more than others and I and I not hit those yet and I can see the black marker and I'll take another pass like that and if it's a big disparity then keep going I'll do one more pass like that now I've got shiny teeth most of the way, I don't have them all. It's not that, don't be that worried about the perfection of it. But you're trying to knock some of those worst ones down and get the height of the teeth pretty close. That's, that's the, the gist of it. That's what you're really after. Now you have, I, this is an extra slim taper file. I have some... I have some extra slim, in fact this may be a double extra slim, and then this is an extra slim. There's slim taper files, extra slim, and double extra slim, and these are out of the package, and I forget what they are. I just know they work. You could probably use the regular three corner extra slim taper file. And then I like going from the, the nose of the saw to the heel, and I do the first few teeth with it 
this face is not plumb up and down, it's leaning back a little. And I'll do the first few inches with that little bit of lean. That way I do have starter teeth if I want to use them. They have a, almost a negative rake angle. They certainly aren't aggressive and, and they make the saw easy to start when you're cutting. I'm going to use my other file because it's newer. Two strokes. You can do like that if you get a better rhythm. Generally you're not supposed to go backwards on a file, but I'm not putting any pressure on it. I'm just setting the file in. Two strokes, come over. That light backwards pull, I'm not putting any pressure on it. And then two strokes. I'm really only pressure, putting pressure on the forward stroke. Because that that is hard on your file to file backwards. Okay, I'm going to begin. I'm going to begin to turn the file so that this face is more plumb. Now I'm plumb up and down with this face. I'm square this way. I'm trying to be level this way. This other bottom face is hitting the tooth in front. It's hitting the back of it. This face is hitting the leading face or leading edge of the cutting tooth on this side. I'm going to keep filing. I'll cut back in in a little bit. Okay, I'm getting near the end. I'll show you. I'm about to here. I lift sometimes because the file tapers a little and it gets you lined up actually and then as you go in you're dropping a little bit to the meat of the file that's consistently straight otherwise there's a little taper up at the, the nose of the file those black permanent marker dots that's helping me see where I haven't been yet hardest thing for me is seeing, especially if you stop, seeing where you are, are stopped at or where you where you left off. That's hard for me. So I like to keep going, but the dots help you. Dots that you put on with a permanent marker. got the last two. Okay, that's pretty sharp right there. Now what I do is I go back through and look. When I did the black marker, I ran the file, a flat file on there, and knocked some of those off. A lot of them I could see. Some of them that I knocked off, I can still see the shiny tips of those teeth. And so what I would do is I'd go back and probably touch that tooth another stroke or two. Like that. That took care of it. Took care of that one. Here's one here. 
Lighting helps you here, having your light work for you in the right position and the right amount. Here's one here. And one here. Okay, that's pretty good. There's one right there. I like an old paintbrush for dusting, get the metal shavings off. Then what I do, these are paddle files. They're diamond. This is an easy lap diamond hone. This is a medium. I go back through and hit the tooth on the back side of the tooth. Here's the back side of the tooth. Each tooth is like this. On the back side of the tooth, I go back and hit the top and I tilt, I tilt, I tilt level a little bit, more level. And that makes that a more of a chisel point. And it's just a light little bit of, uh, I'll do one here, it's just a little touch like that. So I'll uh, move the camera and you can watch a little bit. These are hard to see too. So you have to concentrate on what you just did. This is refining that tooth. It's taking a little bit of the burr off. It's changing the angle a little bit at the very tip of the tooth. And I think it's a worthwhile step for four or five minutes. You can almost get a rhythm going where you jump one stroke, stroke in, stroke back. You need to stop or if you sneeze or something, hold where you're at, stop, and then I tip down and mark my little nick in my wood and it tells me approximately where I, where I want to pick back up again. You know, if the phone, phone rings or something. Okay, you got the idea. I'm going to shut the camera off and then I'll pick back up again. Okay, I'm pretty close to the end now. By the way, I always filed my saws. I didn't do this, and many thanks goes out to Paul Sellers and his wonderful channel and information. This was his innovative idea to use these to refine the teeth, and I've discovered a whole set of uses for these tools, and they last pretty long. Um, so thanks to Paul Sellers, and credit goes to him for this idea. Okay, those feel pretty good and sharp. Now before I shut down, I'm looking at the set in the teeth. Is there any set? It's hard for a saw to work with no set because then the plate binds as you get into the cut. The plate wants to bind sometimes. So uh, I want some small amount of set in the teeth. And I don't set a saw every time. Get this out of there. Um, there are times I would set it. Sometimes I just can't decide without making a test cut. So I'll put a piece of oak in 
device and do my typical my typical one inch oak test. Sometimes I'll take a piece of pine. Try to go uh, an inch deep or three quarters of an inch deep. Very clean. There's your starter cut. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's an inch deep. You know, if it was a dovetail. Minimal tear out. I think I'm going to put a little set in this. When you see, when you feel a little glitch right in there, I feel a little glitch. So somewhere through here, definitely need a little bit of set, or there's an errant tooth that I need to adjust some of the adjacent teeth. In general, uh, I'm trying to say that you don't have to set every uh, sharpening, every filing. You just need to check it and then decide. Okay, we'll try a cross cut with this saw. I still haven't put any more set in the teeth. I've gone through and looked at some of the teeth. There are a few oddballs in there. Uh, nothing too bad, but uh, I have a knife line here and down the side walls and we'll do a cross cut because after all I filed this for a ripping pattern if I can squeeze through here okay I filed this for a ripping pattern after all but let's just see what it does for cross cutting right on my knife wall smooth light motion very smooth light motion so I don't know if you can see this that's very very smooth it's it held my it hugged my 90s real well here's your tear out on the bottom I didn't hardly have any to speak of uh, it's so minimal and uh, some pieces of wood in some situ situations you might put a knife wall in the bottom but that is probably negligible for most things and this is of course utterly clean in the other directions other angles so uh, very pleasing in the cross cut um, I'll, I'll continue to look at the teeth and see whether a few might want to have a little bit more set in them. Okay, I'm going to put a set in a few teeth. I've marked a few teeth, every other tooth. And that just gives me a reference. If I ever get mixed up, go back to those teeth markings those marks are teeth that want to push that way and that that's something I can use as a reference for this whole little section because I can look and go opposite a tooth if I get mixed up if I got mixed up I could jump down here here's one here's one I could dot that one and that tells me it's the same orientation as that tooth so it's just a matter of skipping teeth you go on the other side I don't have any marks, so I could put a mark on a tooth. That would help me know on that side, those teeth, they want to push away from the mark. So that's just a little thing I do 
take my, my set and I could set some teeth here. So it's hard to do in the position I'm doing. I want the camera to be able to see. Probably can't see it. There's some errant teeth here. I'd like to give a little bit of set to these teeth. They lack set. Okay, I think I'm going to stop there. And on this side, I have markings. Uh, it looks pretty consistent. I don't think my camera is good enough to show you an up close. But these are sharp. They, they grab your skin when you touch them and that's what you're after. These are things you, you learn to do through experience and practice. I could explain it all day long to you in an eight hour long video. Until you do it, there's no, there's no way to adequately teach you. You have to do it but these are some things that, that uh, I hope will help you. It's not rocket science. There's a bunch of teeth there. It's like a bunch of little chisels. You can have a bad one now and then. I hate to see a broken off one. And that's why you don't want to set the wrong way on one because I have broken teeth off. Pushing it the opposite way of what it, what it was meant to go. I've done it on old saws and, and actually broken teeth off. And a, and a missing tooth can, can make, you can feel that sometimes when you're sawing. So I hope to help you avoid that. And you want to use a light touch on anything you do with this set or anything. You come along, you're just squeezing it and giving it a little bit of tweak. If you overdo a set, you can put a hammer in the vise with the, with the hammering face up. Set it on there like a little anvil and take another hammer and tap some of the set back out. So these are things you can do. Let's make a cut in the wood. I'll adjust the camera and we will make a test cut both ripping and cross cutting this oak. Here's that pretty end cut I just made. We'll go about an inch deep. I'll do a dovetail angle. Nice clean cut. Very little tear out. I mean very little tear out. There's still a little vibration in the teeth. It's right in the area I did it, right, right, no, it's in front of the area I did. I did through here, right through here, I could give it a, right in there, I could give it a little bit of investigation and see what's going on there, because if I clear that area, I cut really smooth. Let's count the strokes on a three-quarter inch deep cut. One, two, three, four, five. It's three quarters or a little deeper. So I certainly have the force. I mean, I have the aggressiveness I want. And uh, good cross cutting and good ripping. Holding its vertical 90, really well. It holds its 90 really well, and when it doesn't do that, that usually tells you have you have a, a tooth or number of teeth with too much set. But I think in front of the area I did, I'll give these a little more set. 
and I may end up doing the whole saw, but you usually don't well, need to. I'll show you one more thing before shutting down. This saw, as I sawed, still had a little glitch through here and everything was fine and I'm like okay what's what's that glitch and I noticed the saw plate had a roundhouse curve in it and here's another trick for that you can take any vise this vise is, happens to have leather jaws put it in here and just begin to snug it up but you can pull it and the plate was curved this way so as I pull I'm bending up here and it was mainly right back here right through here so if you could see that just pulling it through that vise under tension straighten this and if you could see, this has a straight plate. And it cuts smooth now. There's no grab. Oh, there might be, you know, one tooth somewhere that would want to grab a little bit. You never know if that's the wood or the tooth or your saw or any number of things in the grain of the wood. is. It's uh, cutting really smooth, like that. You know, sometimes it's like a chisel. Sometimes you, you're against the grain and you have to tilt the saw one way or the other to cut. You'll very often you'll see somebody turn like this to improve their sawing. I'm getting nice smooth cutting action. I could turn it over. Cutting down real fast, real clean. Now a lot of these kind of cuts I do on the the pull saws anyway. Just depends on what what the nature of it is. I mean that's just cutting as good as you can can get for a eleven dollar saw and. You know, don't forget that you can put, just like your planes, you can put paraffin on the saw plate and also reduce friction. I mean, that's just as slick as. Just as slick as you could want to cut. So, um. Yeah, let's try a cross cut. It was doing fantastic before. Just beautifully. One, two, three, four, five, six gets me almost almost an inch deep here. With minimal tear out. Negligible tear out. With or without a knife wall, it probably would be fine. This tear out. So, you have to remember, too, I'm playing a game of trying to give the most functionality out of one tool. And that's always a, a game. You know, there are always trade offs between cross cut and rip. There's one other point I want to make is that I'm trying to get multiple uses you know, multi-use functionality out of one tool. And there's a limit to what's uh, reasonable as to, is it, is it possible to have the ultimate crosscut saw and the ultimate 
rip saw in one package? Probably not. Uh, honestly, that's probably not reasonable. But I'm looking for a really good blend of both. So, you know, uh, I take a saw like this and mostly if I'm going to do some long ripping, you know, if I'm in a piece vertically like this, and I'm going to do a lot of ripping. My capacity only goes to the back. So at most, when I say ripping, I'm talking a lot of times about joinery for this saw. Yes, you could put it in and, and keep going and cut farther and farther down. There's uh, ways you could cut this piece and cut, you know, way down into the piece on an angle, especially if you were uh, cutting in the correct angle. Could I keep going? Sure. But in general, that's not what I'm going to do with this saw. And I probably have never made that clear in my videos that I'm, I'm thinking of this saw for joinery. Thinking of this saw that a lot of times a joint can fit right off the saw. I don't have to do anything more to the tenon. If I cut it and I get lucky and cut it just right the first time, I can, I can live with that cut from the saw. So, you know, a dovetail. If I could live with this cut from this saw, And more important to me than raw speed, even though that's respectable right there, is the cleanness and straightness of the cut. Little to no tear out, and that, that cut, if we could see that edge, works in the joinery without a lot of paring and fiddling. And that's your goal with a, with a joinery saw. And I just keep coming back to this saw as a very respectable cutter. For the dollar. For the